Okay, so we're back and we're going to be discussing drug use. If you saw my chart from the end of the last video, I decided to change to a different chart to start off here. So um, this chart's a little bit more detailed. What we have is data going back as far as 1975. The most recent data is 2013. And we see overall alcohol use. You can see there's a significant decline since 1975 to 2013. And then if you look at the, the other red line, that's showing the number of students who report that they have used alcohol and gotten drunk. So you can see that um, there's a lot of kids who are using alcohol and not to the point of drunkenness in the past 30 days. Okay, and then we see in the black line people who report that they have used cigarettes in the past 30 days. And that line had gone up and down from the 70s into the 90s, it went up again, and it's on a sharp decline um, in the 00s and into the teens. Um, the blue line is showing us the rates of marijuana use, which were really high in the 70s, really went down low in the 90s, and then now are trending back upwards. Um, especially with states having legalized marijuana, it makes it easier for kids to get a hold of marijuana today than it had been even in 2013. And so we're probably going to be seeing that line trending upward. On the um, smokeless tobacco, they separated the use out by boys versus girls. And you can see that of the people who report having used smokeless tobacco in the past um, 30 days, and smokeless tobacco is not e cigs that's um, chewing tobacco, things like that. You can see that that's much more common among boys than among girls across the entire time. Um, okay, so those were our drug use patterns, and this chart is only referring to people who say that they've used these things in the past 30 days. So that doesn't necessarily include people who might report that they've used it in the past year or ever, something like that. So here we have past year use, and we have some, some of the same drugs that we saw in the last um, piece, but we have a bunch of that we're not on there. We've got inhalants, so that would be people who are using, um, uh, you might call it huffing, right, where they spray, use spray paints or glues or other kinds of things to get high, um, and that's at the top bar, and so that's a really frequent usage, um, and this is all grades combined of teen years. So this would be um, you know, kids who are 13 to 18 in the school system. Hallucinogens include things like marijuana and um, magic mushrooms and LSD, and that's in the red bar. Ecstasy is in the green bar, and you'll notice that it suddenly appears there. That's because it, that's about when it started to really actually hit the streets. It, ecstasy had been around in the 80s, but it really started to hit the streets and be tested. Um, you know, at, they would ask people about it starting in 1996. Um, cocaine use is in the purple line. Methamphetamines are in the turquoise line, and again, that's something that really hit the, they started asking about it after it really hit the market for teenagers in the very late 1990s. And then heroin along the bottom, and you see that's a pretty stable line there for heroin at the bottom. Overall, if you look across all the different kinds of drug use, it's, on, it, it's trending downward compared to where kids had been. Let's please notice the y-axis, though, that we're only looking at at the peak about 10% of, stu of, of students reporting that they have used inhalants in the past year. Um, I mean, these are, this is a very small subset of people. They really had to zoom in to make the lines even be separate from each other, uh, let alone really appear as um, important. And so we see a lot of trending downwards. Kids are using less and less of these kinds of drugs. Here we have the last two decades, and they've broken it out by alcohol, cigarettes, and then illicit drugs um, is kind of lumping um, all different things that are illegal to everybody, not just to teens, because alcohol and cigarettes in most states are illegal to teenagers, but to everybody would be the illicit drugs. And you see that our numbers end in 2015, and again, you see that line trending downwards. The illicit drugs are kind of coming back up, though, and I think it has a lot to do with marijuana becoming destigmatized and uh, more available. All right, so those are some interesting drug trends. It's kind of an awkward transition to go from drug use and drug trends to, oh, I wanted to say one thing, though, I forgot to mention about the drug use. Um, the, there's an argument to be made in the developmental literature. In fact, um, Janet, uh, Janet Twenge at 
San Diego State University actually thinks it's a bad sign that drug use is going down so steadily among teenagers, and she's attributing it to um, social isolation and avoiding um, human contact, you know, using a lot of the internet and not really going out of your house and being around your peers. And so she actually thinks it's a negative. Um, there are a lot of developmentalists who think that experimentation during the adolescent years is a sign of health. Um, so there are different perspectives on, on what it means to be trying alcohol, especially, um, and then other things um, that might be inappropriate for adults or that adults would look down on, but that teenagers are interested in. Uh, some developmentalists think that that's actually a sign of health, that kids are pushing the envelope like that and trying to, um, she calls it growing up, Janet Twenge calls it growing up, that the kids are trying to uh, throw off their parental norms and do the things that their peers value and that that's a good sign of, of development. Um, when we look at the cigarette use, you see it going down really rapidly. Um, and then there were these periods where if you wanted to to rebel against your parents, the way to do it would be to smoke because parents were disapproving of smoking. So you see in the, in the 90s, there'd been an increase in cigarette smoking and then it, it's going down again. Um, it Now, um, you know, marijuana is not necessarily a rebellious behavior either. Now this is something that is, well, in our state, it's legal. And so, uh, you know, for, for older people, obviously, but, uh, you know, it's, it's in the same category as alcohol these days. And so if you want to rebel against your parents' values, it's not necessarily going to achieve the goal um, to smoke marijuana or to, to drink alcohol early or things like that. And so, you know, Janet Twenge says it's our, our jobs as teenagers to, to sort of rebel against the adult norms and fit in with your peers and that really the goal is to experiment when you're a teenager and then grow out of it and as an adult stop doing it um, or stop doing it the illicit or illegal things or the things that are harmful. So kind of a different perspective than you might have thought developmentalists might have about drug use. Um, now on teen preg pregnancy I thought it was really important to show you these numbers um, across countries. Unfortunately the, the most recent cross-country data that I, I was able to find has ended at 2010. So, you know, we're getting almost a decade old on this data. Um, so what, we, what we've been seeing is that across all the countries listed here, uh, American teenage girls are number one in unintended pregnancies. Um, we have teenage pregnancy being defined as um, women between the ages of 15 and 19. So it's not the full range of teenage years, but it's a uh, and it's not just high school or something, it's 15 to 19. And what they've done is they've corrected for the fact that these countries don't all have the same uh, population. So they're doing these numbers based on how many girls between the ages of 15 and 19 they have. So they're saying for every 1,000 women within this age bracket, how many end up pregnant, that would be the entire bar all the way across, would be how many end up pregnant. Um, the dark orange would be how many end that pregnancy with abortion. The lightest color bar that's in the middle would be how many have, how many give birth. And then the sort of intermediate color there would be how many, how many have um, miscarriages ending their pregnancies. So what you can see is we're number one. Yay, we're number one. We're number one. Uh, but you can see that we're not as far off of some of the other countries as you might have thought. I mean, uh, we are definitely the, the highest rate of un, uh, pregnancy among this age group. But we're not that dramatically off anymore. For a while there in the 1990s, we were dramatically off of everybody else. We had like twice the rate. And it's, it's really dropped significantly. We have um, been enjoying a drop in teenage pregnancy for about the past 20 years. And uh, one explanation is that if you have access to birth control, that will reduce the rates of pregnancy. Um, but that's not necessarily what's causing the drop in teenage pregnancy. Uh, I wanted to look for a second at these different rates of abortions across countries. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the statistics that show us being the highest rate country of teen moms are focusing in on the percentage that actually have babies. And you'll notice that we do have the highest rate of, of girls having babies, but we don't necessarily have the highest rate of abortion. And so in some countries, when girls become pregnant, the like if you look at, at Sweden, the expectation is that it will end in abortion. 
And whereas in the U.S., it's not, necessar not necessarily the case that we assume that girls will, will have an abortion. Um, so a lot of American girls who become pregnant end up carrying their babies to term. That, that is a big difference, and it has a, you know, a lot of different explanations and a lot of different implications. Um, let's go to this next chart, though, that shows these, this downward trend in pregnancy rate. And so, again, this, this chart starts in 1975 and goes through 2013. So we got a little bit more recent, but this is just American data. And so what you see is that the pregnancy rate, the birth rate, and the abortion rate are all trending down from their peak in 1990-ish, right? Um, and really, the, the teen pregnancy rate had been reasonably stable for the previous 65 years. Now, a caveat on that, a lot of girls in the 50s, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s would have their first baby as a teenager, you know, an 18 or a 19-year-old. But they were married, and it was you know, pretty typical to be having your first baby within a year of getting married and, and things like that. So really, when we're talking about the 1990 data, we're not talking about, on average, girls who were married. We're talking about girls who had unplanned pregnancies. Um, so we see this peak of pregnancy rate in the, in the mid-90s, early 90s, and then it's been going down. And so we've been trying to explain why. Uh, a number of things happened concurrently in the 90s. One major thing is that, you know, they had just announced HIV and that it could affect heterosexual people and that women were most at risk. Um, women have roughly twice the likelihood of contracting HIV from a male partner as a male would have contracting it from a female partner. So heterosexual sex transmission of, of HIV is most likely going to be the woman catching it from the man. So a lot of people started using condoms. I mean, that was a huge change when people started looking, looking as, at condoms as like a normal thing to use during sexual intercourse. Um, not to age myself or anything, but when I was a teenager, condoms for one thing were called rubbers. That is not a very attractive thing to call, you know, this device. And so people thought that rubbers were just for, you know, people who were really promiscuous. Um, people didn't think that condoms were for birth control. Um, people didn't really talk about that that very, like that. Um, most most um, older adolescent girls would talk about getting on the pill. They wouldn't talk about using condoms. But thanks to HIV, it became very normal to pe for people to start using condoms. And they became much more available, a lot more styles and brands available. And so people started using condoms. And so STD rates went down as well as um, pregnancy went down. Um, also, people started talking about sex a little bit more openly and talking about um, you know, whether they were willing to have sex or not. I mean, a lot of these conversations that we're having today in the, in the light of the Me Too unit, uh, movement, all these things that are going on, were things that people did not talk about even 20 years ago. People did not talk about, you know, intentionality or whether they were planning on having sexual intercourse, and certainly not teenagers. And uh, things have really changed a lot, and that's helping to bring down the pregnancy rate. Um, another thing that's bringing down the pregnancy rate relates back to what I just mentioned about drug use, is a lot of teenagers are not spending a lot of unsupervised time alone with another teenager of the, of the opposite sex. I mean, it's just not happening at the rate that it used to happen. Um, kids went on car dates all the time in the olden days, and today, and by olden days, I mean like the 1980s. Um, today, kids are doing a lot of group dating um, or not even really going out, and so a lot of relationships are like solely online. And uh, that absolutely is going to contribute to a reduction in the teenage pregnancy rate, that's for sure, because you can't get pregnant online. If we look at the different states, you'll see that the darkest color states are the ones that have the highest teen pregnancy rate, and that the lightest color states have the lowest. And so Washington's smack in the middle as a mid-range teenage pregnancy rate. And again, because states vary in their populations, um, they were all corrected so that this is per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 19. Uh, so Washington is smack in the middle, sort of the average. And then we've got, you know, the, the states that are mostly in that, uh, you know, southern Bible Belt area um, having the highest rates. And then the states that have, um, well, you know, interestingly, Utah has very low rates and also has very strong religious foundations in that state. And so it's not just, you know, you might think to yourself that, People who are in the Bible Belt, they become pregnant because they don't know how babies are made or, or they're told that they shouldn't do it and so it makes them want to do it even more. Well, I mean, you could make a similar argument about Utah and it's not having that impact. So 
Um, it, there's never a simple explanation for what's going on. Some people will point out, for example, that a lot of those really dark states have um, received federal funding for their student for their um, for their sex ed at school. And as of 1993, if you receive federal funding for your school at all, you have to give um, abstinence only sex education. And so some people have pointed to the abstinence only as the possible explanation for why the southern states have higher rates. Um, but Nevada doesn't use the abstinence only program and it's one of the highest rates. So, I mean, there are a lot of variables. It's really hard to say. Um, some people say that, you know, oh, well, you know, it's Eastern Washington that pulls up the Washington rates because, you know, all those kids out there in the farmland have nothing else to do. Well, that's not true. That's not an accurate depiction. Um, there are higher rates among teenagers in the farm areas, but that's not because they have nothing else to do. Um, there may be different values about, you know, Having, having sex, ha um, having children, there, there are different values in different regions. So we have to be really careful about stigmatizing or stereotyping entire areas. Um, but so we're talking about teenage pregnancy like it's de facto bad. And so let's talk about some of the consequences of teenage pregnancy, because there are some negatives, there are some complications. Um, during pregnancy, teen moms are more likely to experience anemia. So that means that they have um, inadequate iron to conduct oxygen. And so they get really weak and tired and it may actually uh, cause birth problems for the baby. It may be deprived of oxygen also, may not grow fully. Um, moms, teenage moms are, are prone to prolonged labor, which is stressful on her and stressful on the baby. Um, so that's problematic. And, and this, you know, the younger the mom is, the more likely these things are to happen. Um, the more in denial the mom is, the more likely these complications are to arise because uh, moms who are in denial avoid prenatal care, uh, don't go to the doctor, they maybe try and hide it, maybe try and go about their normal life and ha hope that nobody's gonna notice. And so they may not be taking proper care of themselves. Toxemia is more likely in teenage moms than in other age groups. Um, and of course, so there are pregnancy complications. Uh, there are social effects. For mom, uh, she's much less likely to finish high school than if she didn't have a baby. Um, not having uh, a high school diploma absolutely is gonna to contribute to financial troubles. Uh, moms who finish high school may not go into college and that's gonna reduce her earning capacity in the long run. Um, moms who have their first baby in their, in their teen years are not necessarily going to, um, well, you might say learn their lesson, right, from having had a teen pregnancy. They may ha actually have in their mind a picture of how far apart their children should be age-wise, regardless of how old the mom was when she had the first baby. And so they may have a second baby while they're in, still in their teen years. And a lot of outside observers will think, well, that, didn't she learn? Well, it's not about learning, it's about what they value and what they think is important. And so if they always envisioned a family where the kids were two years apart in age or something like that, they'll follow through with their vision rather than what might be you know, financially or socially better for themselves. Now complications for the child, children of teen moms have double the rate of low birth weight. And so if you recall from earlier on, low birth weight is being born at five and a half pounds or less. So twice as likely to be low birth weight if the mom is a teenager. And three times as likely to die in the first year of life. So mortality rate is significantly higher. You know, I mentioned a lot of times teenage moms are in denial. And so sometimes these um, risks are associated with the lack of prenatal care. And then also um, sometimes the babies die during childbirth when the moms try and deliver by themselves and things like that. So, I mean, it's a pretty um, desperate situation for the babies oftentimes. Now, along with these raised, uh, you know, low birth weight is typically associated with lower IQ scores anyway. And so we're going to have a higher probability of, low IQ scores, prolonged labor can also be associated with lower IQ scores because the baby might be deprived of oxygen. And then behavior problems are oftentimes associated. Now we don't know if it's something about having, you know, a mom who had been young while pregnant and these complications that go with it, or it might be uh, more about having a mom who's young, who's raising a child and maybe doesn't have the best parenting skills under, you know, in her toolkit. Um, Learning disabilities, as you guys recall from previously, learning disabilities are defined as having a normal or above average IQ and then being one or more grades behind in um, reading or math. And so that's considered a, a learning disability and it's more common in children of teenage parents.
Um, some of the social effects for the child, lower achievement in high school, they may not value high school very much because they, they, the thing that's weird about kids regarding their parents is that kids tend to regard their parents as it seems to have all worked out for you. And then anything that the parent might have done, they say, well, see that it, in spite of that, it all worked out for you. A lot of times the kids don't really know what, what's going on in their parents' lives until the kids are significantly older. And so they think, well, it looks fine. You didn't need to finish high school. I don't need to finish high school. Um, so they may not be very motivated towards high school. Um, they're more likely to become a teenage parent too. It's the same kind of logic. You know, it worked out fine for you. Um, so you might think that they'd learn a lesson and think to themselves, well, I don't want this to happen to me. But a lot of times kids don't internalize that. They instead internalize, well, it seems to have worked out. Now, teenage pregnancy, what causes it? Well, I mean, obviously we know what causes it. And if you don't, you can take my online human sexuality class where we go into thorough detail about what causes pregnancy. But I wanted to focus on like what factors actually contribute to teenagers becoming um, parents. One thing is lack of contraception, but it might not be what you're thinking it is. It's um, not necessarily because they don't know that there is such a thing as contraception. Instead, a lot of times kids who have the idea that um, they aren't planning on having sex. And so they say to themselves, I'm not going to have sex. I will use my willpower. I have already determined I'm not going to do it. Well, sometimes they get swept away and they say, well, I wasn't planning on having sex. I just, you know, I got caught up in the moment and now I'm pregnant. Something that's really interesting about how a person can get caught up in the moment and then that one time that they finally gave in, they became pregnant. Um, it turns out that nature set us up so that at the moment that a woman is the most fertile is when she has the least resistance and she's the most attractive to male partners. And so it's easy to get swept away when the girl is as fertile as she's going to be during the month. And that, so it's like the riskiest time is when the swept away is most likely to happen. Some teens have this laissez-faire attitude about birth control or getting pregnant. They, they will literally say, I don't care if I get pregnant um, or I don't want to use any birth control. And a lot of times they'll have their list of what they know to be the options for birth control. I've had students say to me, well, I don't want to have hormones, so I don't want to use the pill. And, you know, condoms are messy. And that, they think that those are the only options in birth control. And so clearly they haven't checked things out and, and maybe they fall more into the category of either don't care, or maybe they really want to get pregnant secretly. Like maybe their unconscious motivation is to maybe secure the, the loyalty of their mate, you know, the boyfriend that they're dating at the time. They really want to lock them down or uh, maybe they want to show how adult they are. You know, sometimes children, kids who feel like they're being treated like children will want to show their adults in their life how independent and autonomous they are. And so they'll make this giant step because, you know, I'm an adult too. And now you can't tell me what to do because I'm a parent. Um, so it isn't necessarily the best logic, but it's definitely adolescent logic. Sometimes they don't know. And like I said, sometimes they think that they know what birth control methods are available and then they really don't know. Um, sometimes they think that they have figured out when their fertile times are and they've got them completely backwards. I was involved in a study in, the, in grad school where we asked the female participants, and they were all college students, to estimate where they were in their menstrual cycle. And then we collected their saliva and tested their hormones. And we were able to place them in their menstrual, you know, what position they were in their menstrual cycle based on their saliva. And they were so far off. There were women who thought that they were in their non-fertile phase and they were actually in their ovulatory phase. Um, some women who thought they were fertile right now and they were in the luteal phase where there is no way they could become pregnant no matter what. I mean, there's like, they were all over the page. Um, they were some, there were some women who said, you know, my period's late and they were actually in, at least hormonally, in the period that should be after. They just had their period. I mean, the, women don't necessarily know their own fertility cycles and yet they'll sometimes think they know and they'll say, well, I can't get pregnant right now. Um, sometimes people are too embarrassed to get birth control. One of the assignments I give my human sexuality students is to go to the store and at least pick up a box of condoms and walk around the store with it, even if you don't need to buy them and you don't want to. You know, at least go through the act of looking like you're gonna buy them 
and tell me about your feelings. And there's always those students who have had a lot of experience buying condoms and it's nothing for them. But among my college students, the most common response is this was really embarrassing. I was mortified. Um, some stores make you go to a counter and ask for them and because they have to keep them locked up because they're the most commonly shoplifted item. Um, them and uh, razors, razor blades, because they're so expensive, I guess. So being embarrassed can keep people from getting birth control who need it. Maybe they've acknowledged that they're sexual beings, but they are not. It's just too embarrassing. Uh, sometimes teenagers feel invincible. That's not the kind of thing that'll happen to me. That happens to other people. And, uh, you know, I actually had a friend who became pregnant in high school and, uh, you know, I was comforting her and she was deciding what to do. And she said, this is the kind of thing that happens to other people. I thought, wow, that we really, we do care. <laughs> I was also the same age as her. We were teenagers. And I, I thought this, you know, I thought the same thing. I was like, you know, you see this on an after school special. This is not the kind of thing that happens to real people, right? And it happens to real people all the time. But teenagers oftentimes feel like they're invincible and this would happen to someone else. Now, here's an interesting statistic from the most recent um, test. They, they survey high school students about their behaviors related to drugs or to, to sex, different ones. And um, in the most recent one, they asked how, um, if, if you're sexually active. And if they said yes, then they were directed to the question that asked, how often do you use birth control? 33% said never. 67% said some form of not always, like, you know, once in the past six encounters or, you know, t twice. Any, anything that was less than every single time. So it, you'll notice there was no every single time. There was not a single teenager who reported it every single time I've ever had a sexual encounter, I used birth control, which is, you know, kind of an insight into adolescent psyche. Um, you know, there, something's going on. Incorrect use. Um, maybe they were using birth control, but they don't use it correctly. Like in another survey of teenagers, they found that only 40% reported that they take their pill every single day. You have absolutely got to take your pill every single day or you're not actually on the pill. You just own the pill and sometimes use it. It's, it's not effective if it's not taken every single day. Um, and ideally, every single day at the same time of day. So it takes you know, a person who can follow a routine to actually be on the pill. With condoms, here's an, uh, another set of findings from, from that first study. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about how to use condoms. 30, about a third to a half of students reported that they didn't know that you need to keep a space at the tip of the condom. Um, a third to half said Vaseline would be a perfectly fine lubricant in combination with condoms. You can't use any kind of petroleum-based lubricant with a condom because the lubricant will literally eat the condom. It just dissolves. If you ever want to test it out, you don't have to get a condom. You can use it on a latex balloon. Rub the latex balloon with Vaseline or Nivea or some kind of petroleum-based product, you know, um, mentholatum. You can pick whatever you want that has any kind of petroleum in it, and you will literally dissolve the latex. 20% thought that it would be better to use lambskin condoms if you were trying to protect against HIV rather than latex condoms, which is exactly inverted. Latex condoms are far superior in protecting against HIV transmission than lambskin. Lambskin's natural, and so a lot of people have said, well, that's natural. It's made out of, it's not really skin, it's um, the intestines of a lamb and, um, or a sheep. And so some people have said, well, it's natural, and I won't have an allergy to it, and it would be better for me. But it turns out that uh, the pores in the skin are adequate to let HIV pass through, and then a lot of other STD um, bacteria or viruses can pass through, as well as sperm can if you don't use your condoms correctly. So a lot, of, a lot of teenagers, when they're surveyed, don't know how to use birth control correctly. Because of this, um, doctors have been recently advocating inserting IUDs into teenage girls when they're asking for birth control. So IUDs are um, inserted by a doctor, and then they basically take care of themselves. As long as you check once a month and make sure that the string's in place, it pretty much will take care of itself for five to 10 years, depending on which one you use. Um, and so a, a lot of teenage girls are being inserted with that because doctors feel like we can't really trust them to, to take the pills when they should take them and things like that. If you're a teenager and you're hearing me saying this, I hope you're feeling a teeny tiny bit offended that you know, because other people are not being reliable, the assumption if you went to a doctor would be that you need to be fitted with something that you don't have to take care of because we don't trust you to take care of it. 
Um, but on the other hand, it makes a lot of sense for doctors to be concerned about you know, something that's really super secure. The risk with the IUD is that it has been associated with reduced fertility after it's been removed. So it's something to think about. Um, and it include, most of them include hormones because it's more effective when hormones are included. So it's not a non-hormonal way of preventing birth. But, so some things to think about. Um, characteristics of the teen mom. Um, here we have broken down by ethnicity. And what you'll notice is that on the left-hand side, we have all races uh, represent, you know, combined averaged. And the data is from in the blue bars, 1991, green is 2007, and gray is 2011. And so first off, what you'll notice is across those periods, everybody's pregnancy rates have been going down. Uh, but, and remember, this is um, how many girls per 1,000 in the, in the age group. Um, 15 to 19 are becoming pregnant per year. Okay, so the highest rates of teen pregnancy are associated with uh, black respondents, Hispanic respondents, and American Indian or Alaskan Alaska Native. The lowest rates are among Asian or Pacific Islander, and then non-Hispanic whites would be next. So we definitely have ethnic um, group differences. Even if you just look at the 2011 data, you can see that there are ethnic group differences, uh, which brings back that issue of value systems and what people think are important and you know, whether it's that big of a stigma to become a, a, a mom when you're in your teens or whether it's appropriate to be using birth control or not. And you know, factors like that, there's more to it than a simple explanation. Um, goal orientation is another factor that can contribute to um, teenage pregnant pregnancy. Um, girls who have clearly stated goals for their future are much less likely to become pregnant when they're teenagers than girls who have amorphous sort of, I kind of want to do this, but I don't know how to make it happen kind of, kind of goals. So clearly stated goals. There used to be a Nike campaign that was directed at girls that was talking about how girls who have, um, who play sports are much less likely to become pregnant in their teen years. And it's true, girls who have uh, you know, ambition or goal that they know of and they're working towards are less likely to become pregnant. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword though because sometimes girls who, are, who have a very clearly stated goal but it's not necessarily their own, and they're starting to question whether they really wanna do it or not, sometimes will become pregnant because it gets them out of, the, of fulfilling that goal. So it's not unintentional. They'll say it is, but it oftentimes is not really purely unintentional because they sort of, they kind of want to get out of the goal that they had set but don't really want. So things to think about, right? There, there are a lot of things. And interestingly, while girls who are athletes are less likely to become pregnant, boys who are athletes are more likely to impregnate somebody. Kind of goes back to the idea that, that boys or men who have you know, status are more attractive to females, and so they have more opportunities to potentially impregnate somebody. So uh, a lot of differences um, between boys and girls and you know, what behavior is desirable and which one's not. Sex guilt. People who feel more sex, uh, sex guilt, who feel more guilty about sex, are more likely to become pregnant in their teen years. If they are in denial about themselves as sexual beings, and yet are finding themselves swept away, they're more likely to become pregnant. So sex guilt is a big thing. Age, the younger a person starts having sex, the more likely they are to ultimately become pregnant. It turns out that people um, will delay the onset of birth control until they're on average about 16. That seems to be sort of the moment when people are willing to admit their, uh, their sexuality, even if they started having sex earlier. Um, and then, even if you start having sex later, like let's say you don't start having sex till you're 16, on average, people wait about a year of sexual activity before they seek out birth control. And so there's a lot of factors. So the younger you are when you start, the longer it takes you to actually start using birth control. And on average, it takes a year for teenagers to start using birth control. And what's really interesting about that, it takes a year to start, Half of teenage pregnancies occurred in the first six months of sexual activity. And so waiting a year to get birth control is probably not a really good policy because you know, a lot of people will end up pregnant during that period of time. People who, girls who reply, 
um, reply that they're relying on their partner to provide birth control means that they're relying on condoms, which are about 95% effective, so it should work. But a lot of teenagers don't use them correctly, as I already mentioned. Um, and then also they're, they're relying on their partner, and if he doesn't feel like it or he hasn't provided it, they may still get swept away and go with it anyway. And so um, that can be one source. So what about teenage pregnancy? How can we avoid it through education? Um, my pictures did not pop up, so excuse me for a second. We'll go here to this one. Um, so what they have found on my, I gotta correct something real quick and then I'll start running, sorry. All right. So what they found in a, a survey of teenagers, that's thinking, um, is that most teenagers, there we go, male and female, report that they receive most of their education about uh, sexual stuff from a combination of school and then their parents, some kind of formal education and their parents. Um, so that's the top bar, the top part. So most, that's like the biggest bulk for both boys and girls. But for boys, a close second would be the formal instruction only, whereas for girls, it's a, it's a smaller um, close second, right? It's not as close of a second for girls, the formal instruction only. So for most kids, they're reporting that they're getting a combination of formal education and their parents. The, the lightest peach bar there is they get the information, they get information from their parents only. So few, that's like the smallest band, but you got to remember that that's overlapping with the band above, right, which is the formal plus parents. And then at the bottom, the darkest orange would be those people who report that they don't rely on formal education or their parents. That's not where they got that information which is kind of the scariest. And you'll notice the boys have a bigger dark orange bar. So they're oftentimes relying on their friends or the internet or other sources uh, to get information about sexuality. Um, the thing that's problematic about that is that, you know, oftentimes you get really bad information from your friends, um, really bad information off the internet sometimes. I mean, sometimes you can Google it and you find exactly what you need. Sometimes you find some really bad, inappropriate, uh, graphic videos that you get to watch. So um, it can really be a, a grab bag of what you're getting when you're not relying on people who know what they're talking about. Um, what I think is really interesting is that the vast majority of kids are reporting that they're getting information at least partially from their parents or um, solely from their parents. And when they do follow-up studies with the kids and they ask them, who do you prefer to get information from? Do you want to get it from school? Do you want to get it from your friends? Do you want to get it from your parents? They tend to report that they want information from their parents. And they report that because they say that they trust their parents and they know that their parents wouldn't tell them things that are incorrect. And then they also say that they like that their parents share their values through these messages that their parents are conveying. Um, one of the problems with formal education is that they're, because they don't want to offend anyone's values, oftentimes they are value free. And so you don't really get any messages about feelings or um, long-term implications or any of those kinds of things. And so a lot of times teens want to hear from their parents what they think, what, what they should be doing, you know, what did you do, things like that. Um, I'll just give you a little heads up though, if you're ever the parent of a teenager, it's probably best not to use yourself as an example um, because either way, let's say that you did not have sex when you were a teenager, your kids will oftentimes discount your opinion now because you don't know what you're talking about. If you did have sex while you were in high school, then your kids will assume that you just gave them approval to have sex um, before they're maybe ready. And so it's really important that um, other role models be invoked rather than per parents using their own personal experience, because um, that helps to make sure that the kids are getting the message and not necessarily um, giving themselves approval for, for behaviors that parents maybe wish that their kids wouldn't engage in. The other thing I wanted to, Point out is a lot of a lot of argument bandies back and forth between whether we should use the abstinence only approach to sex education or the safe sex approach. The abstinence only approach tells kids that they should wait until marriage for sex, and that um, you know you can catch STIs, you can become pregnant even if you're vigilant, and so the best bet is to put it off. Um, the safe sex approach says those same things plus. Um, talks about condom use to prevent um, STIs, talks about birth control to prevent pregnancy, and so it includes additional information. And so there's this back and forth, which one works better? And, and when we look at, for example, the um, southern states in the United States having higher 
pregnancy rates than the, the northern states. And we know that the southern states are taking federal funding and therefore are doing the, the abstinence-only education. A lot of times people go, see, that's why. That's why the pregnancy rate is higher in the south. Well, it's not really that clear. It really isn't that clear because um, you know, kids are internalizing messages from a lot of places, from their peers, their parents, from their religious training, from all sorts of different things. Um, here's what I thought was really interesting was this um, survey of kids who had had the two different kinds of uh, training and how much they um, how much they thought that the training that they received was helpful in um, them understanding matters related to sex. And the dark green bars are the responses from kids who had the abstinence only approach, and the khaki bars are those kids who had safe sex. And a lot of a lot is made out of that far left pair, where it's 18% of abstinence-only kids say that the program was not very helpful, whereas only 11 of the same safe sex kids said that it was not very helpful. But let's look at the other bars. We've got fairly helpful and we've got very helpful. And while the numbers are different, they're not very different, are they? I mean, I think what we can look at these and think is that less than half of the uh, kids thought that the either program was very fairly helpful and way less than half thought it was very helpful. Um, so we're looking at a very, um, a group of kids who by and large are not thinking these sex education classes are very helpful at all. Um, I, as I mentioned, teach human sexuality and I have students all the time who say, man, I did not know any of this stuff that they learn in a college class that you do not learn in a high school class because we can be so much more specific and we can talk about things that we're not allowed to talk about in K through 12. Um, so formal education might not be the solution for educating kids about how to avoid teenage pregnancy or the value of avoiding teenage pregnancy or other things. Um, probably the more important thing is the messages that kids get from their parents and who they care about and who, who share their values and things like that. Uh, so we probably shouldn't be crying about um, formal education, we should be maybe um, getting educated ourselves so that we feel more comfortable talking to our own kids about these things. The number one best benefit of taking a human sexuality class, according to students who have taken it, is they feel more confident sharing information about sexual topics with their children and with other people who they know. Um, and that's really important. Adults need to be educated also. All right, well that concludes my um, biosocial discussion. So the next time I will see you, it will be cognitive in adolescence.